Good evening. It is Tuesday. This is To Write and Have Written, and I am Laura Van Arendonk Ba, and we have a cool topic tonight. So, whew, there we go. Fresh start. Like we talked about last week, fresh starts. Okay. This week's topic is one that I'm pretty excited about because uh, this is something that I think a lot of people actually probably need to hear and need it to implement. So, uh, we're going to talk about how to use criticism and rejection in a positive and productive way. And that is way more than, you know, just, just get over it, which is why we hear a lot. So, but since we're jumping in, um, this is the week that we talk about craft. Uh, it is, uh, you know, we have weekly themes. So this is craft week. Yes, pup cam. And look, look, guys, my husband brought me dinner like 15 minutes before my sh the, the, we go live. So I've got French fries. So the pup cam comes loaded with fries this week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Video is lagging. I apologize. I'm sorry. Just not even, a not even unusual tonight, like with everything piling up. So anyway, um, so if you came in, if you're just joining us for the first time, fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. This is Craft Week. We're going to talk about a craft theme. Uh, by the way, if you got ads on the way in, subscribers do not get ads and you can get a free subscription through your Amazon Prime account. So there you go. Now you know that. So let's start talking about uh, criticism and rejection and what to do about it. So I see all the time people say, oh, if you want to be a writer, uh, you, uh, you need to grow a thick skin. That is, you know, an, an, a thing that you need to do. And that's, it's just not great advice. I mean, for a number of reasons, first of all, just get over it is not a helpful plan of attack. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh no, more lag than talk. Oh guys, I'm so sorry. I don't know. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, oh, let's see here. Let me see if there's anything I can shut down to make this better. I'm so sorry. Please hold. Um, oh yeah, there's like a big old background update that's trying to take place. So hold the phone. Let me see if I can get, get that off. Okay. And I'm going to do some pausing over here. I'm so sorry. We're going to, we're going to try this again. All right. Fresh start. It is Tuesday. This is to write and have written. And I'm Laura Van Arendonk Ba, and this is craft week. And we are going to talk about criticism and rejection and how to handle them in positive and productive ways. How is that? Good restart? Good restart. Okay. All right. Um, oh man, I am so sorry about the buffering and the, and the lagging guys. I'm sorry. I really am. I will do my very best to, you know what, if this just completely bombs out, I should be recording it locally and I'll be able to just upload it to YouTube and you guys should be able to watch it with less stutter and frame drop there. So we'll, we'll see. We'll, do, we'll see how it goes. Please let me know if it's improving. Throw something into the chat. free French fry for dogs waiting patiently. Okay. <laughs> for humans waiting patiently, let's jump back in. Grow a thick skin or just get over it is not terribly helpful advice because um, for one thing, how do I just get over it? If I knew how to do that, I would already be doing that. So not as useful. So thank you, Shy Red Fox. It's not a stream without a glitch. There you go. All right. So equally bad ignore everything that's not positive feedback. Well, then it doesn't hurt you and it's okay. Well, no, sometimes, sometimes criticism is good. Sometimes criticism helps you get better. Uh, it identifies weak spots that you can shore up or become better at. So instead we should learn how to evaluate, how to filter, uh, and then how to use negative feedback, uh, in a much more productive manner. So what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to move through, um, a series of categories of criticism. And we're going to evaluate how to filter those, how to identify them, and then what to do with them based on what they are. So, excuse me, there's, um, there's what, there's what criticism to even accept, and then what to do with it, if we choose to accept it. 
So, and the reason I'm talking about this is I know people who have gone into writing slumps. Um, I know people who have quit writing. I know people who have unpublished books that have been already published and been out um, because they got a bad review. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe they got a bunch of good reviews and then they got a bad review. So they took the book off the market. I mean, guys, this is, this is too much reaction. You are putting too much weight onto this thing. Um, and this is ridiculous. And if we, um, if you were here for the fear of success episode, jump back a few months. Um, we talked about, you know, that kind of thing and letting that completely disrupt your, your productivity, your writing, the way you view your writing, all of that sort of thing. So tonight, let's talk specifically about negative feedback, getting that criticism and, um, oh, good. It's working. Yay. Things are better. Uh, thanks guys for that feedback. See positive feedback. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so again, we're going to move through some categories of types of criticism, negative feedback, bad reviews, that sort of thing. Um, and you know, then we'll talk about rejection as well. So the first, I'm going to call it an invalid type of, of hurtful, uh, of, of negative criticism is the hurtful attack. And when I talk about this, I'm going to do something that's a little unusual, um, for what I usually do on the stream, which is I'm going to tell a story that in a very roundabout way, you might be able to put in the category of the people who said this. Um, I don't think anybody is going to know them personally. And honestly, I think the odds are better that you will watch me be struck by a meteor here live on the stream than that they will ever see this. So it's not that, um, that they're going to feel called out and, and, and hurt. And what I would like to do is just take this stuff that happened, use it as a case study to, uh, at least it's educational and other people can then benefit from it and not be hurt. And I, and I'm pulling these out because they are, I think really good examples of stuff that, uh, I hear from other people as well. So I'm just going to pull these versions out and talk about them. So, um, so let's start with, that was a lot of disclaimer. Let's just get to the fun part. Everybody has an opinion. Not all opinions are equally valid. And that is a way more controversial statement than it necessarily should be. Um, you know, this should be obvious that not everybody's opinion is worth equal weight in all situations. But if you look at how we do things, look at how people handle stuff, um, you'll see this is not the case. So, um, my day job and I'm guys, I'm sorry if the stream is being bad again, I, I'll, I'll, I'm recording, we'll get it sorted. We'll make it work. <laughs> so, so my day job, I work in animal behavior. As some of you know, um, I'm good at it. I'm known in this field. And so people will hire me because I have credentials and I have, uh, good recommendations and I have referrals, but then once they hire me, it's amazing how many people will push back against the advice I bring because they're hearing something different from a completely uncredentialed source. Not even kidding guys, like actual examples. I am internationally known. I have best selling books. My last international seminar, which was in 2019 because of the world, um, sold out twice in a single day because it sold out. They increased the, they got a new facility to help have more seats. And then that facility sold out in the single day. So I, I come with some credentials and then I'll be talking with a client and no kidding. They will say, okay, I hear you, but I ended up in line next to this guy at the gas station checkout. And he told me, and I'm just like, well, why, why didn't you hire the guy, the gas station checkout? <laughs> you know, like, um, and you know, you see that, uh, oh my gosh, you do. We to totally saw that <laughs> in 2020, but you know, you know, things, things like if you're like, yes, I know that your doctor told you you have appendicitis and you need emergency surgery, but you know, your cousin totally watched a YouTube video that says appendicitis is a made up disease promoted by the lizard people as a means of controlling, you know, whatever. And uh, you know, like, no, it's not elitist to say people need credibility for their opinions to carry more weight than somebody else else's. Okay. I think that's a reasonable, reasonable way, way to put it. Um, so if I say, don't take advice from bad sources, that's, you know, there's not a lot of pushback I should get on that. That's a pretty, pretty fair assessment. Um, so don't give bad advice or criticism the power it shouldn't have. But frequently when that criticism comes from certain places, we're going to give it more power than it should have simply because 
not because the source is credible, but because the source is somebody in particular. And a lot of times that's going to be, you know, family or, um, you know, I just, you know, let's just get into it. So, I mean, if, if, uh, if I were to say here that, you know, okay, we're in a show, we're talking about creativity, we're talking about writing careers, and that's nice, but dance, dance is the only true form of art. Uh, I would probably lose a lot of the following here, and that's completely fair because, you know, why would you take writing advice from somebody who is going to not even address writing, okay? So, yeah, you know, Shirad Fox is saying people just don't always want to listen. So here's here's the personal story aspect of this. Um, 2019, I am invited to a book signing in another state. I fly to another state. I do an all-day book signing, and then I fly directly from that book signing to someplace else to attend a holiday party. And everybody knows that I'm coming late to the holiday party because I've had an all-day book signing. So when I arrive, uh, two people in particular make an effort to say things. Um, one says that um, all real authors have huge blog, to have huge book tours uh, with signings all around the country. Uh, so why didn't I have a national tour instead of the signing that I had just done that day? And someone else helpfully piped up that journaling is far more important than novel writing because it's uh, good for the family and it actually contributes and is useful. And just like, okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, so here's the thing. Let's first thing I need to do is, you know, I've got somebody, I've got two people here saying that, um, one, I'm not a legitimate author and two, uh, my, my writing is silly and worthless. Um, let's, let's evaluate where those comments are coming from and how much I should let them affect me. Right. Reading, um, <laughs> Okay, sorry. I think uh, I think I think my uh, my chat is way behind my video, just from the way this is working out. But yeah, Bridger's spot on about the my dog buddy had a dog 15 years ago. Yeah, constantly. All right. So that's the first person. The first person says he knows that and you know, he knows how uh, book tours, book signing tours work uh, because he reads books. You know, dude, I ride in cars. This does not qualify me to run an automotive factory, right? Like that is. Um, you know, that's not how that works. Is this person a, is this person an expert in the publishing industry? No, this person is not. Okay. So I just need to keep that in mind. Um, you know, it, the thing about journaling is more important than, um, than writing novels. Okay. Let's just completely ignore any historical or social cultural aspect to that. Um, for the record, noveling hugely important to contributing to society. Um, you know, if you look at impacts like Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, Ben Hur, Ben Hur praised basically remade how we consume media, uh, invented merchandising tie-in and marketing and all that kind of stuff that you know is mainstream today. But yeah, let's just ignore all that. Um, had this person carefully evaluated my work and found it wanting, she had not. Okay, um, this was a statement purely there to devalue and to be hurtful. You know, would you just walk up to somebody who is opening a dental clinic and be like, I think oncology is so much more important than dentistry. Like, like, why would you do that? You know, you just, and that would be normally the kind of thing that you would dismiss if you saw somebody do it to somebody else. But when somebody does it to you, especially coming from particular sources, we want to internalize that a lot more and we want to give it more weight than it actually deserves. So here's what I'm telling you. The purpose of those statements, those are intended to be hurtful, right? Whether they are intended to be personally hurtful, whether or not I let them personally hurt me is one thing. That's a whole another thing that we're not going to talk, address right here. But from a professional level, do those have any bearing? Do they have any ground at all to affect how I look at my writing and my career? No, because they're not about my writing. They're not about my career. Okay. Um, there, it's not a criticism of my work, so I shouldn't allow it to be, uh, to affect my work. I hope that makes sense. So just think like, you know, has this person, you know, first thing to ask about criticism, has this person earned the right to have their opinion matter? Is this, um, you know, if this person is saying, well, this is true about the public in publishing industry, but this person has no expertise in the publishing industry, and that person actually can't comment on how the publishing industry works. Now, 
if a, if a reader says in a review, I read this book and I didn't like it. Totally factual review. They read the book. They didn't like it. I have, you know, great. Their opinion is valid because their opinion is, you know, is they can back it up. They actually didn't like the book they read. Um, so then we can take that, you know, the kind of thing and we can address that. We'll do that a little bit later. But the first thing to do is just say, okay, is this opinion, does this opinion even get to have weight? Okay. Is this person qualified to have, a, have, uh, to, to offer critique in this area? So, and I bring that up just because I hear so from so many authors who, um, you know, my family, my friends, whatever said this about my work. Um, they don't like the genre that I'm doing. They don't believe that fiction is important, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I see that a lot in my online groups. Um, and so start with, do these opinions, e now, I, I'm not saying that, of course, they don't affect you at all. Yeah, it would be great if you believed in me. It would be great if you thought I was a contributing member of society. It would be great. Okay, all of those are valid things to wish were true and to, um, and you, it's, a, it's fine to be hurt that your family or friends don't buy into that something that, that is that important to you. But is that a criticism of your work? No. Okay, so just let keep that over in the personal container which, you know, is sadly there and necessary, but it doesn't get to come over and affect what I'm doing professionally. All right. Um, so yeah, I guess the short version of that is it's really sad when somebody says something hurtful, but don't give it more credit than it's worth. Okay. All right. So then the next category is the well-intentioned criticism that's not applicable. Okay. So at least we're moving from intentionally hurtful to I'm trying really hard but I just don't have the, uh, the, the ground to be applicable to your particular situation. Yeah, give me one second while I grab a drink here. This is what happens when you bolt food, like right before you go live is I've got all the salt and everything. <laughs> so, so, um, an example of this and, um, said before, say it again, I love my critique group and, um, so th this is in no way throwing shade when I talk about, you know, critique group dynamics. But not long ago, I submitted pages to my critique group for our monthly and monthly exchange. I got my pages back. I got a bunch of great feedback. I mean, it's the kind of feedback that gets you excited to do the revisions, to do the edits and to keep going, you know, after the rewrites. Um, so, you know, like, oh, this is, this is great drama. This is some of the best dialogue we've seen in the entire series. Um, you know, when do we get our, this character fan club t-shirts, you know, like, oh, it's just, oh, best feedback floating on air. And one set of pages that came back and said, none of this works at all. Okay. You know what? Like, I, I just need to take that. And I'm not even upset by that because I know where this is coming from. This is a critique partner who does not write in my genre. He does not read in my genre. He has completely different sets of reader expectations for his own work because we do fairly different things. Um, I know in the past stuff he's told me, you need to change this. This will really turn readers off. But then when that book was published, um, readers said, you know, this is, oh, this is my favorite chapter. I cried during this, you know, that kind of thing. And so this is just information that I need to use while I'm filtering this. Some of his critiques and feedback are spot on what his stuff is good for. It's very, very good for, but when it comes to big differences in genre and reader expectations, um, I need to be aware that he's not always my audience. Now, to be perfectly honest, I am 100% certain that sometimes he goes home, looks at my notes on his pages and says, the freaking heck, you know, like what, what is this? Because I write in a very different genre. I have very different sets of reader expectations. And by the way, I do endorse uh, having critique groups with a variety of genres in them. Uh, you know, you don't want to just have everybody doing one thing. Um, because I think it's actually helpful to have that kind of cross pollination. Uh, so that's, that's real. Um, but I, what I need to do is I need to be aware that, you know, the person who is reading my kind of stuff and the person who is not reading my kind of stuff will have different opinions when we're doing the critique 
and one of them is more in tune with my audience than another. And that's not, again, I'm not blowing him off. I'm not saying, oh, he's never right. And I'm definitely not saying he's a terrible person. <laughs> okay, what I'm saying is some of his critique is more directly relevant to my project, to this particular project, and some of it is not. And some of mine <laughs> is more relevant to this particular project, to his particular project, and some is not. Hello, has it been too long since a French fry? Okay. All right. Look, there you go. All right. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> Get it back here. Um, so I try when I'm working with somebody else to give caveats, um, especially you know, if it's something like this is out of my genre, this is out of my field, this is where I'm not feeling as comfortable. Um, I was helping someone a few weeks ago and um, I'm like, you know, here's what I think, but you're talking about women's fiction and that is not what I do, okay? I do angsty, I do angsty epic fantasy, okay? <laughs> like, um, so I'm not, I'm gonna give you my, I'm gonna give you my opinions, but I try to specifically say, take what's worthwhile and ignore the rest, okay? But I might forget to say that, or I might just overreach and assume I know more than I do. And it's definitely true that not everybody remembers to say that even if they think it, and some people don't think about even saying it. So having that filter of knowing how to how to select out, um, <laughs> it needs to be a specific genre for, uh, subgenre for angsty epic fantasy. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's where I need to be. That's where I live, thanks. <laughs> so the short version is just know how to filter. You know, be able to look at the criticism that's coming in and say, yes, this is valid criticism and it applies to my particular project, or this is great criticism for a different genre or for a different project, but it's not gonna work for this one. And again, that's it, you know advice that's coming in that's very um, well-intentioned. It's just not applicable to that particular project. All right, so, okay. Um, and, and I'll throw in with that, this is just, I guess, my little writer beware moment. Um, not all editors who will take your money for editing are actually great editors. You know, this is a place where it's really, you know, helpful to do your homework. And if you hire ed an editor, um, you know, make sure that you get somebody who's, who's going to be, you know, good at editing what you need. Um, Again, like angsty epic fantasy and uh, women's fiction probably shouldn't share the same uh, approach. Not to say that somebody couldn't do both, but make sure you have somebody with experience in both and understands the reader's expectations for both. So, all right. Very close to that category is, um, you know, the, the well-intentioned but not applicable review or criticism. I'm gonna put in here the the review that is just crack, okay? Um, and we've all seen these. We've uh, we've if if you're published, you've probably had these. If you haven't had one yet, it's coming, okay? I don't think anybody actually gets away with not getting one of these. But these are the reviews that just that just make no sense. Like you read the review and you're like, did we read the same book? Kind of thing. So. Um, so I, I have some, I'm just going to share a couple of my favorites with you because they're, they're just great. And honestly, I take pleasure in these. Okay. It's, it's a sick, twisted pleasure, but I do take pleasure in these. Um, one of them uh, said my work was a bad Harry Potter knock, knockoff because it featured an English boarding school, not as like a prominent thing, but one of the settings in there was an English boarding school. And I think like, you do know that Eaton predated Hogwarts, right? Like, is that, is that a thing? Like, it's not a story about a bunch of kids, you know, doing stuff at the school. Like, that's not what it is. Okay, fine. Sure. That's great. I'm a bad Harry Potter knockoff because you weren't aware that English boarding schools existed. Cool. That's fine. But one of my favorites um, was a, a review that said this was well written and I enjoyed the story, but um, everything she has in here about vampire society and how vampires do things, it's wrong because that's not how real vampires do it. And um, there's two ways to interpret this. One is that this reader uh, is deeply invested in a particular vampire franchise with a large body of lore and she experienced dissonance whenever she encounters world building that doesn't fit with that previously read body of vampire lore. And, um, you know, so that she just doesn't like the fact that it doesn't all match. Um, or I'm just really bad at, 
you know, watching vampire documentaries and determining what biologists know about vampires. So um, either way, I'm just like, hey, great. Not a good story. It's wrong about actual vampires. Okay, fine. Um, leave these reviews up. I see people um, sometimes get really upset by the by the crack reviews and um, and they want Amazon to take them down or they want people to vote them down or you know, whatever. Guys, no, I'd say leave that because um, if nothing else, if that's your bad review, if you know, if, if, if people are looking, because I'm one of those people, I always look for like the bad reviews on stuff that I'm considering buying, right? And if I look for the bad reviews and I'm like, wow, that's a crazy person who doesn't like this. It actually makes the product look better. <laughs> okay, so leave the, leave the reviews. So, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to jump back and catch up with the chat for a little bit, just because we do have such a huge gap with the video and the chat lag right now. Um, yeah, Shy Red Fox is mentioning that filtering is super important. Uh, she got advice that conflicted and neither suggestion worked for the manuscript. This happens a lot, and we're actually going to talk about that later, too. But being able to filter and identify, you know, this is applicable, this is not, um, even with the best of intentions, you know, it, you know, intentions don't make competency, right? <laughs> so that. Thank you, Bridger, for being a little like how real vampires do it with me. Yeah, that was definitely one of those. I just looked at it and I was like, thank you. I needed a laugh today. That's good. All right. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, KT Ivanrest, Kate's pointing out um, she saw similar reviews on a book with unicorns, many low star ratings because the unicorns did not behave like unicorns are supposed to. Part of this is, you know, the you know, if you're in a genre, um, there are genre expectations. Like if you're going to have a romance, but it's not going to have a happy ending, may not want to put that in the romance category. Readers are not going to be cool with that. Okay. Um, so there are certain, um, there are certain times when you just need to be aware that it might be easier to go with the flow. <laughs> but on the other hand, I mean, I've had crazy stuff show up in my books. Like, I'm never going to get over the one that uh, was really angry about the gay menage a trois that I put, snuck into a book. And I'm like, I I wrote that. i pretty sure there's none in there. Definitely not happening on the page. Like, was I don't know, like, did you read another book and confuse it with my? I have no idea. Okay, so sometimes you just let stuff go. Like, reviews are out of my control. My job is to write a really good book. Then I get out of the way. And if people are, again, leave the crack reviews up, guys. If they're, if they're mad because it didn't behave like a real unicorn, let that sell books to people who are interested in seeing unicorns that are a little bit different. Okay? Yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> yes. But wolves and wolf stuff are real. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, this is where I, maybe it's a double standard. I don't know. But um, if you're going to have wolves in your book and... Um, and, you know, guys, don't don't go into the real life animals and then get your animal behavior wrong because the person who works in animal behavior will judge you. Let me just say that. All right. Um, yeah, I do. I have answered many emails for people asking about animal behavior and how to make their wolf packs more realistic or how to, you know, um, their their fantasy creature that they've invented, how to make it give it a more plausible ethology. Guys. Find an expert who's happy to help you. Seriously, nerds love to talk about their stuff, okay? But there we go. Okay, side. <laughs> Shoo. All right, next up. Um... <laughs> okay, sorry. I just, I was heading to the next category, but then I got Grace's uh, chat that said one reviewer tell that when the food supplies got low in the story, they should just eat brains, not a zombie story. Look. Brains have been a historical food product, less commonly eaten now, but in, in this North American culture, but do did happen uh, much more frequently. And um, however, if you've got brains, you probably have something else that the brain had been in. So maybe start with the whole body option. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Really fun stuff. Um, you know, I think you, people, you can't control reviews. I had another one that I, when I think I literally laughed out loud when this came out, um, they were angry that my character was anti-capitalism and used quote unquote salty language. And I read the, and I'm like, this is a Christmas story where she 
actively, overtly monologues about the importance of relationships over materialism and not letting, uh, you know, greed hurt, hurt the environment and hurt people and hurt society. And like, there's nothing language in the story at all. Like the word crap doesn't even make it into the story. There's literally nothing. I don't think darn or heck are in the story. I don't know where you're getting this, but you just let it go. Anyway, all of that to say, Phew, let's get back to, uh, let's get back to categories. Um, so the next step, so there's, there's all the things like, um, you know, the, the crazy stuff. Now, what if I get criticism that is valid? Like there's a review and it complains and I'm looking at it and I go, oh, that's a fair complaint. Or I get criticism on my story from critique partners and I'm like, oh, how dare you be accurate when you say this is needing some work, <laughs> okay? Um, so yeah, it, it hurts, but you know, this is why we have that filtration system, okay? So I look, go through and I can filter out the things that don't matter, that don't apply. So then when I get to the ones that do, I can take this now and turn it into a proactive um, task list rather than having to sit around and be sad about it because it's not hurtful. It's not personal. Uh, it's actually here to help make my stuff better. Okay. So um, I had one review um, that I read and the reader said, the story started very strong and a really interesting villain. But then as we went on through the story, the villain's motivation seemed to disappear. So he was just a cartoonish bad guy by the end of the book. And I was like, oh, so my intention was that I had a villain who started with a reasonable cause, but got more and more invested in that cause and started making less and less rational decisions, um, just getting carried away with, you know, the, the mission. And, um, so that by the end he was not thinking clearly, but it clear, I clearly didn't achieve what I was going for, for that particular reader. Um, you know, I didn't make that clear enough that that's what was happening for that particular reader. So, you know, that's one where I read that and I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to make a note of this for future books that, um, that, that kind of, I need to be careful about writing that kind of devolution so I, that people can see what's going on there. Um, you know, if I get, my critique pages back and my critique partners say they didn't understand a scene or they didn't get this or they didn't um, catch this little plot point that I was so certain I had put in there in a right, in a good way. Um, yeah, that stings, but I need to redo the scene. They're not telling me this, you know, my critique group is awesome. Okay. Nobody in there is going to tell me something just to be mean. They're going to tell me something because they want me to succeed. Right. So, um, so first of all, get yourself some trusted critique partners. <laughs> okay. Um, but if they'd give me that information, um, and here's the thing, like my work is very, 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 very personal. That's how creativity works. Okay. It's really personal stuff, but it's not me. I am not words on a page. So if people critique the words on the page, they are not coming after me. They're telling me how to make the words on the page better. All right. And it's easy to get that confused because darn it. Why is my baby ugly? Why do you think my baby is ugly? <laughs> but, um, but that's a good thing. So, you know, and sometimes, sometimes this is something where you look at this and I don't know, I'll just, I, another personal example, I wrote a scene. Um, this was actually in an early version of, uh, Shard and Shield. And I wrote a scene where, you know, one character verbally eviscerated another character and humiliated him in public. And, um, gave it to some uh, beta readers and all the female readers came back with, oh, terrible, worst person ever. I hope he hits by a bus or whatever the world building equivalent, this particular world's equivalent of a bus is, you know, that kind of thing. And the male readers came back with literally, I don't know why this scene is in here. Nothing happened. And I looked at this and I'm like, okay, so in a broad generalizing sense, um, women tend to be a little bit better at picking up that you know, social verbal evisceration than your average guy does, who tends to be a little more either we're cool or we're uh, chest thumping and angry. Like, you know, I'm hugely, okay, okay. but anyway, um, so I can be upset that they didn't pick it up when I was trying to do that subtle evisceration thing, but that's information that I need to know, right? So I rewrote the scene with a lot more uh, bluntness to it. Um, and yeah, Sharon Fox is saying, you know, men and women have very different critiques. Yeah, it's, 
and then you know it's it's not not like you can draw a hard line and there is no bleed over obviously but um you know this is one of those things where it might be good knowing who is your audience who are you writing for if my audience i used to have a tool and it, it died so i no longer have this data but it was fascinating data when i had it on um who was following me on social media who was interacting with um you know uh you know my my profiles and uh who was clicking on what things and all of that and i could look and see okay um, for this kind of for this kind of work that I do, my audience is seventy percent female. They have this political set. They have this uh, set of values. I mean, you know, um, as far as you know, social shows social values or financial values or you know whatever. It was fascinating information. The tool's totally dead. Don't bother asking me. They just vanished one day in the middle of the night. Um, so <laughs> I had paid them money. Anyway, um, all that to say, um, if I know that my audience is 90% female, maybe I can write that way and, um, and not worry about catching everybody up. But if I know that I'm writing for um, men and women both, and um, you know, I want to be more encompassing my writing, I'm going to have to take those critiques. All right. So, all right. Oh, great. Oh, good. So Kate's got a, um, a comment that I think some writers believe every review is valid and that they owe every reader because they feel guilty that the reader spent money on their book. Yes. And at the same time, no. <laughs> so thank you, Laura. That was very helpful. Um, so part of let's let's jump way back. I don't even know how many months ago this was. I don't know, August, September. I have no idea. But we were talking about marketing and I said one of the primary things of marketing that people don't think about with marketing is I need to filter people away from my book. Marketing is turning some people away from my book. OK, so that's part of the reason we need to we need to be really targeted and do a good job of marketing exactly what our book is, because I don't want you spending money on my book if you are not the kind of person who is going to like my book. And it feels so wrong, especially when you're getting started and you're like, I have two readers and one of them is my mom. OK, um, and it feels so wrong to to try to filter people away from your book. But that is what prevents that kind of review of I, you know, I expected A and I got B. I don't even like B. Great. Then don't buy my book. <laughs> OK, so. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point. And it's just, again, is why we need to put so much weight on properly identifying and marketing our book to prevent that. Now, if I have done a great job of saying I'm writing angsty epic fantasy and you should only come and pick this up if you like angsty epic fantasy. And if you love angsty epic fantasy and you pick up my book, then yes, I owe you a great book. OK, yes. But if you're into, I don't know, I go back to my my standard, you know, my standard genre when I'm trying not to offend somebody in particular is like, OK, paranormal fly fishing romance. Um, which is not an actual genre, so I can make fun of it. But if you had, if that is what you are into and you pick up my angsty epic fantasy and then you don't like it, yeah, you probably didn't. I'm not going to be upset that you said you didn't in your review because you said the truth, okay? I'm just going to take a note that I need to do a better job to make sure I don't have paranormal fly fishing romance readers picking up my angsty epic fantasy book. All right, we're going to have, poor Amazon's going to have like eight new categories by the time we're done with the stream. Okay. <laughs> so where I'm going with that, the wrap up there was that if I have evaluated the critique, if I've evaluated the criticism, whether it's in um, critique on unpublished pages or a review on published pages, um, I need to take that seriously. I need to take that, apply it, put it in my, you know, maybe physical notes, who knows, and make sure that the next thing I do Tape runs off that takes that into account. Okay. So, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So then we move into how do we translate criticism? Because um, just, <laughs> I didn't like this may or may not be useful from a, uh, from a, how do I fix it standpoint? And I think it was Shai Red Fox who said earlier, um, she got two sets of crit critiques and they, you know, they disagreed with each other and neither of them really worked for her story. So the, yes, that's super common. This is let's get into to um, uh, how do we translate 
the feedback that we get. And the first thing I want to do is um, I had to go and look it up because I remembered Neil Gaiman saying this and I had to go look it up and get his exact words, which are, remember, when people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them, they are almost always right. When they tell you exactly what they think is wrong and how to fix it, they are almost always wrong. Okay, so if you've got, um, this is this is where I, I think we, we have to allow a little bit for skill level. Like if I'm working with somebody who has done a ridiculous amount of writing and a ridiculous amount of editing and maybe is a professional editor and they say, this is your problem and this is what you can do to fix it. Okay, I'm gonna give that some credence. But if I hand stuff to a beta reader who is not a professional editor and they hand it back and they say, I don't know, I didn't like this scene or, you know, or I like, I didn't like the scene because it was boring or because it was slow or, or whatever. It is, I need to recognize there's something wrong with that scene, but they may or may not be the best source on how to fix it. Okay. I need to, you know, they, they can identify that it's wrong, but they're not necessarily the, it's not their job to fix it, right? They're not the mechanic. So, um, oh, never mind. Hold everything. Chat's gotten out of control over here. All right. Um, paranormal fly fishing, um, people are into it. They want to read it. Are the fly fishers paranormal? Are they fishing for paranormal fish? Um, got, okay, we're going to open up a new project. That'll be, um, yeah. Hey, hey, why don't you hop up on the chair? Thanks. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm seeing potential for a, uh, stream groupies anthology that we all come together and do our own paranormal fly fishing stories. Okay, there we go. Um, oh, right. Grace does have paranormal flies, but I don't know that anybody actually uses them for fishing. You just have paranormal flies that hang around in the lake in geysers. Yeah, that's the, um, it's Grace's, uh, magical geyser superpowers series. So, um, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Good job, guys. All right. Excellent. Let's get back. Um, we actually have a time limit to wrap up today. Um, so we're, we're going to get back on. So translating criticism. Criticism comes in. I need to say this is wrong. Again, you know, the, the metaphor that I use for this is, you know, if, if I'm experiencing symptoms, if my leg hurts, you know, whatever, I go to a doctor, they may or may not diagnose it correctly on the first try, but the symptoms are real. Okay, just because it may or may not have an accurate diagnosis doesn't mean that, you know, the symptoms don't exist. So if somebody says, you know, this doesn't work, believe them. But then I might have to do some more legwork to find out, excuse me, how it doesn't work. So. Hey, it's me interrupting myself. So after the stream last night, I went on to do some more work on a marketing project, which is involves reading all of the reviews on Goodreads for the series. And I noticed as I was um, reading through all the Shard and Shield reviews, pretty much every review that had a complaint complained about the opening of the book, which, hey, you know what? I will own that. The first 20, 25% of Shard and Shield is the weakest part of the entire series. That's, I will own that. There's a lot of moving parts. I, yeah, I'll just own that. But what's interesting and what underscores what I was saying here uh, is that while there's a consistent you know complaint about the start of the book, it's expressed in so many different ways you know, that often contradict each other. The start of the book is too slow. The start of the book is too fast. It's um, it's too complex. There's there's not enough information. You know all of these different complaints about the same thing phrased in entirely different ways. So if I were to say, oh man, these complaints actually contradict each other, therefore there's nothing wrong, I would be missing the boat because I know that is the weakest part of the book. That is in fact the weakest part of the series. Uh, but you know, the, if I just relied on, you know, oh, let me grab this one review, that'll tell me exactly what's wrong and how to fix it. No, probably won't. I need to look at the bigger picture. So. Yeah, just thought that that was um, a really clear-cut illustration of that immediately after I got off the stream. I was like, oh man, I should have done this project two hours earlier. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. Thank you. Now, back to me. Um, so I cannot, unfortunately, give you the the diary, or the, sorry, the, the glossary of secret critique phrases so you can immediately read A and it means B or, you know, whatever. But some things that I'm just very generally going to float out there and then by all means, you know, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, 
But sometimes if somebody says something like the plot doesn't work, what that might mean is the characterization does not illustrate adequate motivation. Okay, so, you know, the plot might be fine. I'm just not seeing where it's coming from. There needs to be more characterization to make me believe it. Boring might be actually just a lack of stakes, uneven or slow pacing, a lack of characterization, you know, that kind of thing. You know, and so there's a number of things to look at there. Um, if it's, oh, it's too over the top, it's too ridiculous. Well, it might be lacking justification for actions, character actions or character abilities. You know, I need to make this more plausible in some way. So again, there's numbers of ways that, um, that you can take that and interpret that. Um, but what I'm, where I'm going there is just because somebody said this doesn't work, the, the next sentence of this is how to fix it might not be your best place to start. It might be. Okay, it really might be. But don't feel like that's if that's not working, then, it, then all is lost. And don't feel like if their suggestion to fix it doesn't work for your story, that their comment that it didn't work well for them is invalid. Because the two are both good pieces, but they're separate pieces. So, okay. Um, let's talk about rejection. So we're finally getting around to, I've worked through all the layers of criticism. And um, so now we're going to talk about, you know, I send it off and I get my rejection letter back. And what do I do with that? Um, first of all, totally fine. Have a sulk, get some hot chocolate, get some dark chocolate, get whatever makes you feel better. That's fine. But here's what I want to emphasize. First of all, rejection is very normal. Rejection is very, very, very normal. Rejection is super normal. I keep a spreadsheet with all my submissions and then when they comes back as acceptance or rejection letters. At my peak, the absolute highest point where I, the year that I was killing it, my acceptance rate was 18%. Okay. So that's roughly two acceptances for every five things, you know, still rejections still outnumbering at my pinnacle. And that's a ridiculous number, by the way. Um, so, there's a lot of reasons. You know, first of all, I, I'm, and the reason I say this to start interrupting myself and backing up, but I feel like I want to slip this in here. Um, I've had several writers tell me, well, I sent something out and I got rejected, so I guess I'm not cut out to be a writer. Like, no, <laughs> congratulations, you're normal. We'll get you a membership card. Like, <laughs> you're fine. Um, there, you know, it's totally, it's, if you're not getting rejected, you're not sending stuff out. Okay, and you need to be sending stuff out. So there are many reasons. What you need to understand is there are lots of reasons for rejection, and not all of them is because you're terrible. Okay, yeah. Hey, hey, Laura, is rejection normal? I might be hammering this a little bit because I hear so often from people who don't understand that it is completely normal. So I'm sorry. I have a hobby horse. Can I get on it again? You will hear this again from me. So. Other reasons you might get rejected that other than you're terrible and you should never write again. Um, there's lots of reasons. So um, ones that I know about, um, you know, are they really like, you know, your paranormal fly fishing romance, but they just accepted a paranormal fly fishing romance last week. And for some reason, the market will not bear more than X number of paranormal fly fishing romances. They're not going to have more, more than so many of them in a quarter. So, um, so they don't pick up yours because they're already full for that genre. Okay. Um, that is pretty common, especially in, you know, in traditional publishing. Um, one of my best, and most horrible rejections of all time. I submitted for an anthology. The editor wrote back and said, yours was my favorite story of all the stories that got submitted, but yours was very different from everybody else's that got submitted. So it won't blend in a complete anthology. So I can't accept yours, um, you know, in order to make the anthology work as a whole. Totally valid reason. I'm so glad he took the time to personally tell me that he did like my story, but it was a rejection. Okay. Um, sometimes it's just an opinion. You just hit somebody at the right or the wrong moment. That same story, that was that one editor's favorite. I sent it off to a different editor and I got the harshest rejection letter of my life and basically said, maybe you should consider go taking some writing classes. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. Um, 
those, by the way, are extremely rare. Like harsh, mean rejection letters are not quite a myth, but they're kind of legendary. Like you, you're very, you're not likely to get them. But, um, but I just, but just to say that this was literally one person's favorite story and another person's don't even bother story. And so if I had based my responses on just one of those rejection letters, I would have a completely skewed view. Okay. Um, uh, Shard of Elan, one of the things that um, I get in reviews or in comments or when I see people talking about it on Instagram or, you know, whatever, um, and people mention a lot is the world building. Before I decided to go with self-publishing, I was right on the edge between, you know, traditional and self-publishing. And I went back and forth in my brain a number of times. I did submit traditionally and um, uh, the agent rejected it because it didn't have good world building. That's the thing that gets listed all, all the time in, in reviews on it today. So again, a lot of times you're just catching somebody at the right or wrong moment. You know, they have headaches too. They have bad days, you know, whatever. Or, you know, your timing was bad because they opened yours right after they opened the other one or whatever. Here's the thing, what we do with rejection. We learn from it. We use it to filter and make our next, uh, to choose our next step. If I'm consistently getting rejected from one market, I am going to look for a different market that is more amenable to the type of work that I'm producing. There are thousands of places to publish things. Okay, not even, not even talking about self-publishing, talking about traditional publishing. They, everybody's got their own particular flavor, their own particular niche. Find the thing that likes yours. Okay, so um, I can learn to choose my market better. I can learn to present my material better. Maybe I realized that, um, you know, my, my synopsis could be stronger. My query letter could be stronger. Okay. So, um, here's a tip that, um, I've seen, I'm just going to pass it on. This is not original to me, but when you put together your list of, okay, I've got 20 places. I'm going to send this, uh, this query. Don't send it to all 20 places in the same day. Send it to four or five, get those, um, Back. First of all, if, if you if you get an acceptance at that point, hooray, okay? But if you get rejections back, if the rejections all suggest, you know, the same kind of thing, you have time to fix that, to take those notes, re- do some revisions, and then send it out rather than burning your all of your bridges one, in one t- go before you leave yourself some room to revise and send back out. So, um, oh, Thanks, Kate. Okay. Um, I got to revise and resubmit once. And when I asked if there was anything in particular I could fix, she basically said, yeah, I read it again after coffee this time and it's fine. Guys, agents, editors, they're humans. Okay. <laughs> like like sometimes, uh, sometimes really, really, it is just about the luck of the moment that you hit them. All right. That, that happens. Um, so here's the other thing I will tell you. If you get a personal rejection letter, it's a win. Even if it's a mean one, like that guy sent to me that one time, he took the time to write me a personal rejection rather than using a form letter. All right. Like that is the, that is the, if you've seen the, the, the mem of, you know, you are the worst writer I've ever heard of, but you have heard of me. Okay. That's that right there. Um, but seriously, if you get a personal rejection, um, consider that actually a little vote of confidence. Um, my first rejection ever was a personal rejection letter. He took several paragraphs to explain that, you know, okay, this is good. This isn't, this is why I'm not taking this. And I was too dumb and too ignorant to realize what a huge thing that was for my purse first, uh, rejection letter, you know, from a brand name publisher. So, please, you know, don't, don't get that rejection and just assume it's the worst thing that could, you know, it means the worst collection of things that you can think of. There's lots of reasons to get rejections and many rejections are actually, you know, pretty good or or can be helpful for you. So the other thing is, if you remember, um, I think it was last week that I talked about using rejections as a goal to ensure that you're actually submitting your work. Um, you know, if I have a goal to get five rejection letters this month, that means I have to send work out at least five times. So uh, that's a great way to make sure your stuff is going out the door. And then, oh no, if one of those rejections turns out to be an acceptance, oh, that's the kind of failure that I can live with. Okay. So there we go. Um, thank you guys so much for your 
chat, uh, commentary and feedback and complete derailments about paranormal flies and all the glorious things. I really do appreciate that. Next week, we are going to have Emilia Blazer coming in talking about metal casting for writers so we can get uh, things right when we're writing about our historical or fantasy worlds and we're doing all the lovely castings. Um, it's also just going to be really interesting and cool because she does really interesting and cool things. Um, Emily, she, Emmy is also um, into some reenactment with, uh, you know, uh, Viking era Norse uh, reenactment. So, you know, if you have specific questions about that, she might be a good person to talk there. Um, oh, thank you, Shy Red Fox. Um, and Next week is also our Quitter's Day Achievement Party. And remember, sorry guys, must be present to win. So make sure you show up on the Twitch stream for that. And then on the 20th, uh, Shy Red Fox will, and I will be doing a bonus episode along with Sable Aradia to, for uh, the World Anvil, which is a world building tool, tool that I am just getting into. And so they, who are much more experienced, are going to spend some time talking me through it. And then you can totally listen in and ask questions and get expertise as well. So, um, so that's going to be good stuff. So um, metal casting, Quitter's Day Achievement Party, world building. Uh, and the world building is going to be on the 20th. That will be a bonus episode. And then... Now at this time, we are going to take a little field trip. I am going to hop over and raid, if you guys would not mind coming along. Um, my sister is starting a stream uh, in just a few minutes and I wanna jump in with her. So um, if, you, uh, if you just sit in the chat, you will automatically be taken over. If you have not done some raids on Twitch before, it will automatically carry you over and you'll actually get um, some channel points, I think, for doing that. So, um, what am I trying to say? Mm, yeah, when we're doing drawings and stuff in the future, it actually you know gives you more points for the raffles and that kind of thing. So, we're gonna try rating, 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 rating. And everybody, just when you arrive, just do random cheers in the chat. Welcome her. She's only done a couple of streams, so we want to make this really cool and big. So, oh, thank, yeah, sorry, sorry, Shy Red Fox. I was just getting to that. I don't have an official raid call. This is my first raid that I've ever done. So we're just going to cheer. 